You know, many people think the world is a cruel, horrible place, but it's not. That's Dr. James Doty, professor of neurosurgery, founder and director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education, and New York Times bestselling author. In most situations, people want to be kind, they want to be caring, they want to be helpful, but you have to create the environment to allow for that to happen. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp Video, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. I sat down with Dr. James Doty to discuss why your past doesn't define your future, why the most successful individuals focus on being of service to others, and how to shift from being a victim to being in control of your destiny. When you can understand that you have incredible power within you, which means that you have self-agency and you are not relying on some sort of outside event to determine your fate, things change. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Dr. James Doty is a clinical professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at Stanford University and the director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. He's also the best-selling author of Into the Magic Shop, a neurosurgeon's quest to discover the mysteries of the brain and the secrets of the heart. I began our conversation by asking him about the challenges he had to overcome at a young age. I grew up in poverty. Essentially, my entire childhood, we were on public assistance. And you can imagine that situation. We were evicted from various homes. Uh, my father was an alcoholic. Uh, he was a binge drinker. My mother, when I was a child, had a stroke and was partially paralyzed, chronically depressed, uh, had a seizure disorder, uh, sadly attempted suicide multiple times. So uh, you can imagine growing up in that type of an environment is very challenging constantly afraid. It's somewhat chaotic because you can never really plan anything. And uh, you have a sense of hopelessness, despair, anxiety, and oftentimes feel that you have no future. And it, it seems like whether it's through luck or, or providence, you know, at age 13, right, you walk into a magic shop and there, there's this woman named Ruth who obviously made a very profound impact in your life. If you kind of speak to what, what led you to that magic shop and then ultimately what, what the start of that relationship was with Ruth. Sure. So what would happen frequently uh, is when conflict would occur in my house, I had a orange Stingray bike and I would get on it. I lived in the high desert. I would get on it and ride as fast and as far as I could go away from that. On one of those times, I um, ended up in a place I actually had not really been in town and was at a strip mall. And in that strip mall was a magic shop. And I had an interest in magic at that time. And in fact, I had a broken trick that I wanted to uh, uh, replace. And I walked in and there was a woman at the counter and she was sitting on a stool. Her arms were resting on the glass counter. She actually uh, was an older woman, and she had these glasses sitting on the tip of her nose with the chain and wavy gray hair and wearing a blue muumuu. And, you know, she looked up from her paperback and she smiled at me. And I'm sure you've met people who their very presence or essence, when they look at you and smile, it's very open, it's very inviting you feel embraced by this wonderful presence of this person. And she was that type of a person. And I asked her about this particular trick. And she said, I am the owner's mother. I know nothing about magic. I'm just minding the store while he's on an errand. But we began conversing. And what she did was actually create what we now know as an environment of psychological safety. Because from my background, with my experiences, Oftentimes, people take you for granted. They're very judgmental. They don't embrace you in any way. And uh, she was just the opposite of that. And this led to actually a conversation that went fairly deep. And look, if you're in challenging circumstances, 
especially as a child, you really don't want to announce that to other people because you're ashamed and you're in fear of being judged. But I didn't feel that way with her. So uh, I answered her questions. And at the end of about 20 or 30 minutes, she said, you know, I really like you. I'm here for six weeks. And if you show up every day, I think I could really teach you something that would really help you. Now, of course, as a 13-year-old, uh, 12 or 13-year-old, I had no um, insight, self-awareness at all. But what I did know was three things. One is she was very nice. Two is she was giving me chocolate chip cookies. And three is, frankly, I had absolutely nothing else to do. So I did show up. You've already answered the question, but just essentially what, what led you to showing up every single day for six weeks straight right, to, to, for someone you, you just met? Exactly. And again, it was this sense of trust and actually sort of a curiosity about what, in fact, she was really talking about. So, so I'm curious. I, I've heard you describe that a lot of what she, she helped you with is it's kind of the, the mental practice of whether it's mindfulness, visualization, or positive thinking. And just if you could describe some of the specific things that Ruth taught you, because I, I, I imagine that you probably had some sort of expectation as to what the, those lessons would be and then what they ended up being. Well, first of all, uh, I mean, frankly, I had no expectation because, you know, I didn't really hang out with adults in that type of a situation. What she did teach me or make me understand was, one, when you grow up in those types of environments, uh, which are chaotic and, as a result, unpredictable, that's a type of ongoing trauma. You know, we use the term post-traumatic stress disorder with soldiers, but children can uh, develop post-traumatic stress disorder from these types of chaotic environments where you never know what's going to happen to you. And as a result, you're very much on edge all the time. And what that means is that you chronically stimulate this part of our nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, and specifically the sympathetic component of that, which is this flight, fight, fear, or freeze mode. And as a result, you're releasing all these neurotransmitters and hormones that uh, tighten your muscles, they dilate your pupils, they make your heart rate go fast. I mean, you're always uh, in fear. And I really had no understanding of that or actually self-awareness of that. But what she did was she had me actually go through an exercise where she had me relax and very intentionally go from the tip of my toes all the way up to the top of my head, concentrating on just relaxing my body. And in that process, I did not realize, in fact, how tense I was all the time. The other thing she made me realize, and this was through this uh, a breathing exercise, and of course what I'm describing to you are uh, two components of a mindfulness practice or a uh, based on the mindfulness-based stress reduction uh, that was popularized by John Kabat-Zinn. So I did this body survey, which is the terminology used now. I, I relaxed, and then I started breathing slowly in through my nose and then releasing it over three to five seconds. And the very nature, actually, of doing that causes an interesting physiologic phenomenon, which is it shifts you from your fear mode or engagement of your sympathetic nervous system to your parasympathetic nervous system, which is what we call our rest and digest system. And the difference between these two modes is that when you're in the rest and digest uh, system, if you will, different physiologic things occur. One, your heart rate slows down. It demonstrates what we call increase in heart rate variability, uh, which is actually good. Uh, your blood pressure decreases. Your immune system is boosted. The production of inflammatory proteins is decreased. And of course, these are associated with chronic disease states. The production of stress hormones, such as cortisol, decrease. But the most important thing is that the area of your brain, uh, which is called your executive control area, actually is allowed to function at its best. When you're stressed and anxious, you shut that down and you're in survival mode, which means you are looking for shortcuts to survive. And you don't need that component if you think about how we functioned on the savanna in Africa, uh, which you have to remember, our DNA has not changed one bit 
over the last 200,000 years. So we are still that animal, if you will, on the savanna in Africa. So you need to, needed to make instantaneous, quick decisions that are essentially automatic to allow for your survival. Well, of course, in the modern world, it's a completely different situation. And while the modern world, for many people, chronically stimulates an individual's um, flight, fright, or fear response, it is not practical and it doesn't serve us. And so being able to have access to your executive control functions, which means you have access to a memories, prior experiences, knowledge that you've gained through uh, experience, reading, et cetera, then you can make much more thoughtful, discerning decisions about how you function in these situations. And that's really, really critical to survive in modern society. There is a quote that has been attributed to Viktor Frankl, although actually no one's been able to find it in any of his writings. But regardless, this this concept of stimulus uh, versus reaction. And in the sympathetic state, it's an instantaneous reaction. But what uh, the quote says, though, is that between stimulus and response, there is a pause. Within that pause lies your freedom. And what that means is that you can actually train yourself to have that pause before acting. And as a result, when you take a little bit of time between four and six seconds versus your instantaneous response when you are afraid, that changes everything. And as I said, it gives you access to much more information that allows you to make a much more thoughtful, discerning choice. So those were the first two things she taught me. The other aspect is that what I didn't realize is that to learn, you have to be present. And what I mean by that is if you do surveys, actually, of most people, 78% of people are either thinking about the past, what should have been, could have been, might have been, or a future which has not yet occurred, but they are not present. Yet everything happens in the present moment. And if you're distracted or lost in these other places, you really can't make authentic, true connections with another human being, yet everything that happens, either for good or bad, is uh, due to these direct interactions. And so this is one of the uh, challenges we also have, which is when engaging with another individual, you have to process whether the interaction you're having actually is with that person or with the baggage that that person is carrying at that moment. And what I mean by that is, as an example, I was doing a project with a younger physician colleague, and we would meet every week to go over the project. And he was also in a transition period where he had left his job. He was 35 years old or so, and he married two children, small children. And as you know, in the United States, we do not have universal health care. So if you leave your job, you take COBRA insurance, which is this uh, gap insurance that you pay for before you start your new job. Well, he was trying to save money. His family was healthy. He wasn't worried about it. But about a week or two after he quit uh, his job, his wife noted a lump on her breast. She went to the doctor and it was malignant and they had no insurance. Well, he came to my office one day after he found this out. And instead of our usual, uh, very friendly conversation, he was confrontive. He displayed anger. And certainly this was not his usual behavior. And Instead of being reactive to that, which many of us would do, which would be being confrontive back and being aggressive back, uh, I looked at him and I said, you know, this isn't like you. What's going on? Well, he burst into tears, right? Then he explained the situation. Now, fortunately, we were able to get him COBRA insurance retroactively. Fortunately, 
they removed the mask. She required no therapy and it all worked out. But the point I'm trying to make here is that on the surface, of course, this person appeared angry towards you, but in fact, it was not the case whatsoever. And by taking the time, I was able to get at the source of what, what the driver was. And so many of our interactions with people aren't about this event. They're about what recently happened to them, and they have not resolved it. And that is the driver of their behaviors. So, so it's interesting because I, I'm curious, even going back to you as a, as a 13-year-old, as you're learning this stuff, I, I remember you describing at one point that this took you from a, a position of being a victim to one of understanding that your choices in life were not those of others, but rather your own. And it seems that by having a greater control and, and being able to regulate your body's physiological response to stress, that you can become a much more proactive versus reactive. And how does that, I mean, I'm just curious, is that a big leap to make to, to say that that allows you to go from being a victim to being in charge of your destiny? Or is it, is it literally that? Many of us, as you point out, feel we're victims of our external environment. And certainly on some level, that can be true. But, you know, there's a Stoic philosopher who was a former slave by the name of Epictetus, and of course, if you're a slave, you cannot control your external environment. But what he said was, the thing I can control is how I react to my environment. And what a lot of people don't understand is that they are in control of that. And oftentimes, events are simply events, and they don't have a valence of either positive, negative, good, or bad. They're simply events. How that event affects us is our choice. And I think that for many people is a revelation because these things happen automatically and we don't really process the reality that how we react is our choice. And that reaction can also be affected by how you perceive yourself. And what I mean by that is, and what Ruth taught me, was that the voice that was in my head, I thought was fact. And what I mean by that, and I think this uh, affects 99.9% .9 of people and that other 0.01% per, who deny it are liars, actually. It affects all of us. And that's this voice that says, you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, uh, people are gonna find out you're an imposter, you're not worthy, you don't deserve to be loved, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And as part of ev our evolution, negative things stick to us because it's the negative things that put us at risk. You know, positive stuff isn't going to endanger our life. Negative stuff can, and as a result, it is much more sticky. And unfortunately, as part of that fact, negative commentary often gets embedded in our psyche, and we believe that that is truth. And one of the things that Ruth taught me was that uh, it wasn't true. And if you look at mindfulness-based stress reduction as an example, it's really based on simply the body survey, the breathing, and the reality that when these negative comments come up in your head, you do not react to them. And that's where its benefit comes from. But part of the problem with that is that it doesn't teach you anything about compassion in an explicit way, and it doesn't teach you how to change the dialogue in your head. And in some ways, uh, what Ruth taught me is what I would call mindfulness plus, because it's a recognition of this dialogue, and it gives you tools to allow you to change the dialogue, which fundamentally is what we call self-compassion. And subsequent to those events that happened to me uh, in the late 60s, an immense amount of research has been done that shows that when you can be compassionate to yourself, when you can be kind, when you can change the narrative, it actually changes not only your own physiology, but also how you see the world. As an example, when you are telling yourself these negative comments, what that does is it in and of itself stimulates 
your sympathetic nervous system and uh, creates this chronic anxiety and fear. And of course, it reaffirms itself because once you feel that way, then that justifies you saying you're not worthy and you're not good enough and you can't do it. And as you know, if you say you can't do something, by definition, that becomes reality. So by changing the dialogue, by repeatedly saying, I am worthy, I deserve love, I'm smart, I can do anything, uh, that changes uh, completely uh, what is happening in your brain. And when people are self-critical, oftentimes more so than they are to anyone around them, it makes them also very judgmental of others and suspicious of their actions, which then, again, stimulates your sympathetic nervous system because you feel you can't trust them. The other thing about this conversation going on in your head is it's one-sided. And what I mean by that it is that it's all about you. And when you're able to shift the dialogue, accept yourself, know you deserve to be loved, it changes how you look at the world. And you're much more thoughtful. You're much more kind. You're much more inquisitive. You're much more non-judgmental. You're much more accepting. You know, I gave you the example of that interaction with the young physician colleague. Because of my experiences, I inquired at a deeper level as to what's going on instead of just reacting. And that changed everything. The other aspect is uh, in my own situation as a child with my parents. I used to have a lot of anger and hostility towards them for obvious reasons. They didn't nurture me. They didn't care for me. They weren't there for me, et cetera, et cetera. But what I realized was that they, in their own ways, were suffering deeply and they did not have the tools to deal with their suffering. So in the case of my father, to um, assuage the pain that he was experiencing and his inability uh, to function under stress, he drank. In terms of my mother, she went into a depressive state. So what it allowed me to do was to forgive them and not have any anger or hostility. And the anger and hostility that so many of us carry because of our own negative judgments actually impede our ability to function at our highest levels. And what I mean by that is human beings have the incredible ability to intuit others' emotional states. Well, if you run into somebody who you feel uncomfortable with, who you sense is constantly angry, who you sense is uh, judgmental, you don't want to be around them. And conversely, if you meet somebody who's kind, with an open heart, who's caring, who sees the world for what it is, and I would call that the true nature of reality, well, then you're much more accepting, you're much more thoughtful towards them. And in my own experience, uh, people go out of their way to help you. You know, many people think the world is a cruel, horrible place, but it's not. In most situations, people want to be kind, they want to be caring, they want to be helpful, but you have to create the environment to allow for that to happen. When we're at our lowest, it can be difficult to believe in our own potential or that the future can and will be better. However, Dr. Doty believes that having a positive self-image is necessary to get out of those dark places. Well, first of all, your statement is very true, because unless you believe in yourself, nothing can happen. And in fact, Margaret Mead, I think, made a statement, which was the greatest changes in human society uh, always begin with one person, right? Oftentimes, we have a feeling that I can't do this or I can't do that, and we believe that. Obviously, that is a self-limiting statement, which, getting back to our earlier conversation, becomes truth. When you can understand that you have incredible power within you, which means that you have self-agency and you are not a victim and you are not relying on some sort of outside event to determine your fate, things change. Now, 
listen, I, I don't want to imply uh, everything is merry and perfect. And if you just do X, Y, or Z, you know, the clouds will part and uh, everything will be right. That can happen, but it usually is one of continued struggle and challenges. But a optimism within yourself and this energy you release that actually set the stage for other events to happen to you in a positive way. And I'll explain that in just a second. When you use these negative comments and repeat them over and over again, what I tell people is it's as if you're building a prison wall or a cell for yourself. And each one of these negative statements uh, adds to the wall. And if you continue, what happens is that the walls get higher and it starts getting dark, which only re-emphasizes your negative statements. But when you change your perspective of the infinite possibilities that are contained within you and realize that within you is this incredible power and energy, it allows you to escape from the prison. That is the key to leaving the prison. And suddenly when that happens, a light goes on and you are no longer in darkness, but you're bathed in the light of your own abilities to change everything. And you mentioned um, manifesting, which is essentially what you're talking about. And a couple of comments on that. There is a belief that has been publicized in a ton of books about something called the law of attraction. And this belief that if you want to be rich, if you want to live in the big house, if you want to have everyone admire you, you go through all of this uh, exercises that they offer and that will happen to you. Now, that is certainly possible. But I would suggest to you that that is wrong. Life is not one of doing things that only benefit you. And you can tell, you know, I made this list in my book of 10 things I wanted, but that was from the perspective of a 12-year-old. And I learned a lesson from that. Did I get everything I wanted? I did. Was I happy? No. And the reason is the driver of my behavior and of my manifesting related to my own shame and insecurities. If I just did X, people would admire me and feel I was worthy. If I did Y, people would admire me and I would feel worthy. And each step I took on the quote unquote ladder of success, as I'm standing at the top of the ladder, I still felt empty and was not happy. And here I am, you know, I go to medical school, I become a neurosurgeon, I become a professor at Stanford, I am a successful entrepreneur worth tens of millions of dollars, I have a penthouse over, overlooking San Francisco, I have Porsches, I have Ferraris, and I'm dating beautiful women and flying in private jets. And I would come home every night and feel more empty and unhappy than I had ever felt in my life. Because happiness is not things. Happiness, just like we were earlier talking about, manifests within yourself. And that is accepting of yourself. Accepting that you're not perfect. Accepting that you're a frail, fragile human being. Accepting the fact that you make mistakes accepting the fact that you have this shadow self that you're ashamed of and that has resulted in you making decisions or actions that you wish you had never done. And sometimes you continue to repeat them and it creates more and more shame. And understanding that that acceptance of yourself is acceptance of your own humanity. And it is something that everyone carries with them. And when you're able to accept yourself and, and your shadow self and not push it away and act like it doesn't exist or try to uh, ignore it, 
when you were at your weakest or most challenging, that's when it raises its ugly head. And that oftentimes will lead to drug and alcohol abuse. It'll lead to um, sex addiction. It'll lead to arguments. It'll lead to creating uh, situations that make other people's lives uncomfortable. And it's all because of lack of acceptance of who you are, because who you are is actually okay. You don't have to hide. You can be vulnerable and you can be accepting. You can be non judgmental. And when you are in that state, that is when you're happy. When you switch from me, me, me to we, 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 you win. And the way you win is because you have a calmness about you. The way you win is because people want to be around you. The way you win is because you were being of service to others. You were not under the delusion that you are so important or that people should kowtow to you or that if you just get this, uh, everything is going to be better and make you happy. Some of the most unhappy people I know are people of great success and wealth. They still have not connected between the part of them that's deep inside of them, which oftentimes is still this child who has suffered trauma and carries that with them. And uh, when you're able to come to grips with that, you realize that these external measures of success are irrelevant and are not going to make you happy. And this is the failing of the false gospel of the law of attraction. Because what happens is that external things, as I said earlier, will, will not make you happy. One of the problems in our society, which has permeated throughout the globe, is this belief that if you become, quote unquote, successful by Western society standards, become wealthy, that you will be happy. And this is a completely false narrative. You know, we have immigrants from third world countries who want to come to America and they come here and they see that the emperor has no clothes. In many of these countries where we have some of the greatest Eastern traditions that have been developed in terms of wholeness and self-awareness and insight, you know, these people come here believing that if they get a car, if they get a house, if they have a job, everything is going to be perfect for them. And the reality is where they come from, if they have shelter, if they have security, if they have food and a minimum income, that actually for many people is makes them extraordinarily happy. And you can just look at films from around the world and see this truth. There is a saying actually attributed to John Steinbeck, which said, the reason socialism did not take hold in America is because of the false belief that the poor could become rich. And in America, a lot of poor people, a lot of middle-class people falsely believe that people who have attained these external attributes of Western success are, quote unquote, truly successful and happy. And it is 100% a false narrative, but unfortunately, it gives these people a certain degree of power and influence over the have-nots. As a result, people are willing to give these people passes in terms of the horrible negative attributes that wealth often brings, which is a degree of selfishness, which is a degree of hurtfulness, which is a degree of ruthlessness. You know, for those of you who haven't read the book, what happened to me was I had very much a rags to riches story. Here I started out in poverty. I became a neurosurgeon, a professor, a successful entrepreneur, as I said, living in a penthouse, cars, da 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 da. And I made a bet during the dot com thing and in six weeks lost $80 million and uh, was effectively bankrupt, owing $3 million. And of course, multiple things happen in that situation. One is everything disappears, which includes many of your quote unquote friends. Two is your bankers and your lawyers suddenly become your best friends. 
And I had to scramble to pay off a $15 million line of credit in the face of uh, being $3 million in the hole. So, of course, I had to sell my penthouse. I had to sell a villa in Florence. I had to sell cars, et cetera, et cetera. When I met with my lawyers, interestingly enough, I had made some gifts to charity based on stock in a company that had not yet gone public. And I went through this very deep period of reflection because, again, I had the classic rags to riches story. And now I was back at rags again. What I realized was, as I explained earlier, what I thought was success was a false narrative And I was actually incredibly unhappy with all the things I had worked so hard for. And when I realized that, and my attorneys told me they actually had not filed the paperwork for this gift of stock, I had the possibility of being wealthy again. And in fact, when that company went public, it was worth about $30 million. And I gave it all away in the face of being $3 million in the hole and losing everything. And what happened, though, I shifted my perspective because I went from thinking it was all about me and what defined success to changing my mindset, which is fundamentally actually what Ruth was trying to teach me, but I was 12 years old, 13 years old, to realizing that happiness and success happens when you're of service to others. Now, this is not to imply that you don't enjoy being in a penthouse or driving Ferraris, but what it means is that that's not the goal. The goal always is to be of service. You know, there's a Tibetan mythology that talks about the hungry ghost. And, you know, for these wealthy people, they need the accolades of the poor uh, to make them feel good. And that's why they'll spend a lot of time showing off the next yacht, the jet, the Rolls Royce, et cetera, et cetera, because they believe that these accolades, watching people kowtow to them, will fill the fundamental emptiness that we're all born with. And what they find is it never does. So instead of having insight and self-awareness, they keep doing this more and more and more but there's always an emptiness, a hunger that they can never fill. When you orient your life towards one of service, of caring for others, the return you get is a different type of admiration from people, which fills that void within you and is actually sustenance. And that food, if you will, is what allows you to truly grow, to thrive, and understand the difference between I and my needs versus a perception of we are in this together, the other is me, and therefore my obligation is to be of service to the other. When you're of service to the other, that is when you in fact are being of service to yourself. So Jim, there's there's a lot that I want to unpack there, and it's funny you, <laughs> funny you, funny you mentioned a Rolls Royce because we are actually giving one away in November at our conference. Although I will say we are giving it to the client who's had the most like transformation personally and professionally. So there, you know, perhaps that is it, it is really m- very much about them. And and when you read things like Adam Grant's Give and Take, right, the, this idea of we succeed when we help others win, and to a lot of what you're describing in the sense that money doesn't make you happy, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. But I imagine a lot of people listening, and and in fact, they've done studies and they show like even markets in California, when you look at net worth, the higher the net worth, the higher the incidences of anxiety and depression and so on. So they see that correlation. But yet I still wonder for someone who does not have money and is struggling and they hear this idea of private jets and nice cars and this penthouse, as much as you could say to this person, yes, money won't make you happy. Does that person still want to find out though? Just, Just to be sure, like how do you bridge that gap? Well, no, I think you're absolutely correct. And listen, I'll tell you, uh, fucking flying in a private jet or driving a Ferrari or whatever is fun. I mean, it's great. I live in a big house and uh, I uh, uh, drive nice cars. I'm not saying that there's a negative aspect of those things. 
listen, if you've worked hard and you are kind, you're compassionate, you're of service to others, I don't believe there's anything wrong with living well. And, you know, it's interesting because oftentimes you'll talk to rich people. And as an example, even in my business, the center I run at Stanford, you know, I'll I'll see someone who has a private jet, is carrying a $25,000 Birkin bag, and they'll argue with me about paying an externally extraordinarily qualified person more than an administrator or an admin person. And you sit there and go, what the fuck is wrong with you? You know, to be successful in your business, you would pay a high performer an amazing salary. But somehow, if you're in a nonprofit, you're supposed to fuck these people. You know, it's a very interesting attitude from some of these people. But getting back to your original question, Again, I don't have any problem with that. I'm just telling you, though, that if your repeated driver or motivator is to have those things, at the end of the day, you're going to be unhappy. So it's not a negation of Western success, if you will. What it is, though, is an understanding that if you chase things that are, at the end of the day, helpful to people, that ultimately will make you happy. As an example, look, do I live in a nice house? Indeed, I do. Uh, Do I have nice cars? Absolutely. Uh, Do I enjoy it? 100%. But the other thing is, I don't need it. If it's all taken away tomorrow, it's okay. And this is the difference. The difference between feeling that this external stuff that you show off to people, this external stuff that you carry identifies who you are or that you have to have it or you're going to be unhappy. That is the difference in philosophy here. Again, if I lose it all tomorrow, it was a fantastic ride and I thoroughly enjoyed it, but I'm still who I am and it's not going to change my kindness to people. It's not going to change how I walk in the world. It's irrelevant. It's great, but it's irrelevant. And I think that's what people have to understand. And again, they also have to understand that they will climb this mountain, they will get all of this stuff, but for a large percentage of them, they're not going to be happy. Unless you are oriented towards being selfless and being of service, and I'm not talking about gratuitously. As an example, you know, I know people worth hundreds of millions of dollars and they'll pat themselves on the back for giving $25,000 away. That is ridiculous and insulting. But when you actually are of service, when you engage in an activity yourself, that is a benefit. When you actually give something away that has a significant impact on people, not due to a tax strategy, not due to get self accolades, but to actually authentically do it, that is what will make you happy. Achieving greater happiness in life is something nearly everybody can get behind. However, for many, it seems like the edge of the horizon, always out of reach, something that many strive for but few achieve. Dr. Doty has given numerous presentations on hacking your brain for happiness, and I asked him to elaborate on this. Well, first of all, a couple comments. To get there, you have to stop focusing on getting there. What I mean by that is, again, you have to change your orientation Because the path to getting there isn't ruthlessly doing everything to get there. To get there is, and it's going to be a struggle and there are going to be ups and downs, is though to not necessarily focus on the end point. Because attachment to outcome is one of the greatest causes of human suffering. It is the journey that you're on to attain this, and it is the journey that you're on when you are bringing others with you, when you're being helpful, that will ultimately get you there. Because when you struggle, when you have fallen down, if you're ruthless about getting what you want or having attachment to this goal, what you will suddenly find is there are not that many people who are interested in helping you, period. I can name innumerable examples of that, and I'm sure you can too. In fact, with those types of people, uh, people relish them failing, frankly, because they deserve to fail. But 
if you realize that none of us get anywhere without the support and help of other people, and you accept that as truth, then you realize that is the driver for you to be kind and helpful. And that is truly how you get what you want. And I know you keep emphasizing uh, this point of, well, for the poor people who aren't there yet, well, getting there is not the pinnacle of success. I hate to tell you. People love to use me as an example of, wow, look at Jim. You know, uh, he's made all of this success and he came from this, uh, you know, challenging background. I am like a LeBron James and not in terms of basketball talent. But, you know, to get at the level of LeBron James, that's one in a million. And most of these profound success stories are one in a million. But it doesn't negate the fact that where you start out at isn't a determinant of where you end. And where you end may not be at the pinnacle of affluence. Frankly, if you're honest, you work hard and you go from dire poverty to being a manager of a store. That's a great, great success. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's nothing to sit there and say, well, I'm just here now, but I'm really going to be X, Y, or Z. And that's wonderful to have that goal. But if you're focused solely on that goal, it results in you not being present because you are focused on a future. And when you focus on a future, when you're attached to that outcome, that is what will make you unhappy. If you focus on the present, if you focus on being of service, that creates the likeliest path for you to achieve anything you want, because it is not just you in the struggle. It is everyone around you wants to see you succeed. So in terms of focusing on the present versus the future, for example, let's say something like goals, right? If, if somebody's doing goal setting, which which could be future based, would you say when doing goal setting, make those goals about others and and helping others succeed, or just against goal setting entirely? Well, there's nothing wrong with goals as long as you're not attached to the outcome. As I said, it's just at what cost, right? Because if the cost is you being a ruthless asshole, you'll get there maybe, but who wants to hang with you? What did that mean? So let's say you got all of that stuff. I ha- As an example, I was recently on Necker Island. I don't know if you know Necker Island, Richard Branson's Island. I was giving a talk there. So there was a young man who's 28 or so who is worth $300 million. Okay, nice kid. But when you talk to him, it's not about being of service to others, although he'll create a narrative in his mind about that. It's his r- true goal is to be worth a billion dollars. Okay. And I say, well, why? What what is it that you're going to get when you're worth a billion dollars versus now? Well, I'll be part of the billion dollar, the billionaire club. And what does that get you? Well, I get to hang out with the billionaires. And I, I, but what does that get you? I mean, do you think the billionaire class is some sort of special, unique group, group of people? Because I'll tell you, having spent a lot of time with them, and while there's certainly a number of exceptions, but a lot of them are just self-absorbed dickheads. I I mean, why would you want to hang out there? And what is it you're going to do with that money once you get to a billion? Well, I'm going to make three billion. And what is it once you get to five billion and 10 billion? Uh, How is that being of service or doing anything for anybody except for filling a void you think you have by saying, I have this much? It is a zero-sum game that is in no way guaranteed to make you happy. Now, don't get me wrong. Look, I've hung out with these types of folks, and I've been to all the cocktail parties. I've been to all these high-level events, and they're just chimeras. There's nothing there other than self-congratulatory bullshit. And I'm sorry, uh, (laughs) that's just been my experience. I don't need that. Now, it's wonderful to be there. It's like driving a Ferrari. Do I like Ferraris? I've had multiple Ferraris. It's wonderful to drive fast. It's wonderful to have the wind blow through your hair. So what? Do you know what makes me much more happy is to be with a child who is suffering and relieve their suffering. That is something that is much more beneficial. That is something that sticks with you. That is something that defines your humanity. Getting lost in this extraneous crap, it's wonderful to have it. It's wonderful to acknowledge it, but it's nothing. 
And unfortunately, you know, there will be people, uh, I'm sure, who may respond to my commentary that say, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And, you know, it's great being on my yacht and hanging out with these people. Well, okay. Uh, <laughs> who am I? Um, so. So on that note, I mean, I, I was going to ask, so do you believe that people that are in that you know, experience where perhaps they would either disagree with you or are chasing, whether it's material items, whether it's financial goals, whatever it might be, that they are deluding themselves in some way as to you know, perhaps they may say, hey, this makes me happy. Are you arguing that, well, maybe not? No, they're fucking deluding themselves. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. uh, they are. You know, they're lost in a narrative that they don't even understand or have self awareness. You know, when you look uh, out at the world, you will see people who have a depth of knowledge and self awareness that gives them insights into a much larger picture. There are other people who are more base and who focus on many of the things and thinking that's the greatest thing in the world. And again, you know, I, I've hung out with a lot of these people. And in some ways, it's sad to watch because, you know, they're telling you about their Birkin bag. They're telling you about their private jet that's taken to them to the exclusive party in the Hamptons. Okay, if that's the way you want to live, I would much rather be in a uh, hut in Africa working with poor and helping them lead a better life that allows them to care for their children and brings them the next level up. Now, maybe that's just my worldview and it's okay. I mean, obviously there are difference of opinions. I'm just saying for me and for the work that I have done, that is a much better place to be than fooling yourself that uh, hanging around with rich people is the sum all and be all of human existence. It is not, period. I've heard you say as well that some of the most profound experiences you've had is with people who have truly lived but are dying. And, and if you could elaborate on that, what, you know, what is it that stops people from living? Well, uh, in some ways, it's exactly what I was talking about. It's a focus on material things. It's a focus on competitiveness. It's a focus on ruthlessness. And it's interesting to watch because when you're with someone, quote unquote, who has truly lived, this is a person who's worked hard. They're satisfied with their life. And whether that's a life that has affected the world in a positive way versus simply having a positive impact in their community or with their children, these are the people who happily accept their fate. And that's not to say they want to die but they're not clawing to live. Versus some of the people who I have been with, they, they will fight, they will deny, they will do everything they can to avoid dying. And they're people who very often are people who have believed falsely that they have control. And they believe falsely that they have control because they have stuff. They have wealth, they have influence, and they realize that there is no influence when you're dying. And in fact, uh, you know, I'm writing a new book on manifestation, actually, the neuroscience of manifestation. And the first sentence is, the universe doesn't give a fuck about you. And the reality is that when you are in that position, and I'm an atheist, so I have no belief necessarily in the hereafter, but if you posit that what we do know is that we are here in this moment and that we have no control of events necessarily, well, then you are able to accept your fate because all of us are going to die, period. And if you die with $5 billion in the bank, you are still dead. And in fact, if you look at the history of these families that great have great wealth, by the third generation, 99% of it's dissipated because you haven't created a situation that actually has the values uh, that allow someone to flourish. And those values are being of service to others, kindness, compassion, connection. So again, my repeated experience is those who cling and demand that you fix them and say, I'm not going to let this happen, or, you know, I want this or I want that, 
there's nothing, they're going to die. And you try to calm them, you try to help them, but a lot of them are very angry uh, about it versus simply saying, I'm ready and I accept my fate. You know, it's it's fascinating to me in in a way your story and I do you've used this almost as a cautionary tale, if you will, to where you know at first you almost, it, this is you know very early on in your life these were the things that you were chasing then you had achieved them and you perhaps you know didn't like the person that it, you became or even uh, how you felt and now have outwardly rejected these things and I want to make sure that when people are listening they they do understand I, I don't know that what you're saying is there's something wrong with gaining material wealth. But, you know, so long as you're doing it in a way that's positively impacting your community, you're helping others, you're doing it in a way where you're taking care of people as an alternative of just piling money on for the sake of piling money on. As we talk about all of this stuff, I know you've spearheaded a lot of research on compassion and altruism and the relationship with the brain. Why those two particularly? Why compassion altruism? Yes. Well, let me give you the definition. So, of course, compassion is the recognition of another suffering with motivational desire, um, to alleviate that suffering. Altruism is a form of compassion, uh, and often that term is used incorrectly uh, in the context of, well, I just gave money away, I'm being altruistic. Altruism actually means you are doing an action to be compassionate at a potential significant cost to you. As an example, you're standing on a bridge, uh, you see the water sweep a child into the river, you jump off the bridge to try to save the child. That is altruism. You are putting yourself at risk to save another's life. It is not writing the check when you're worth $2 billion and you write a check for $25,000 and you tout around that you're being altruistic. That is a joke. And this is the sham of philanthropy in many ways. If you really examine it, uh, while the United States does give more than any other country to philanthropy. The majority of it comes from the average person percentage-wise than from the rich. The other is that the rich, unlike the poor, have the advantage of being able to hire highly trained lawyers who create tax strategies that allow them to avoid paying their fair share. It also gives them access to opportunities that the average person will never see. You know, the average person uh, maybe makes three to five percent on their money year every year if they're lucky. If you look at the billionaire class, uh, they're typically making 15, 20, 30, 40, even 100 percent of their money every year or so. Uh, and again, because they have access to information that the average person does not have. Yet, Every decision they make, uh, and again, I'm being making a blanket statement. I do not mean to do so. There are a number, a number of very wealthy people who are doing wonderful things in the world. But the vast majority will not make a move unless they, their uh, tax attorney reviews it. They uh, do not in any way suffer from the amount of donations that they give in terms of it having any effect on them whatsoever. And in fact, even in the face of, quote unquote, the amount of gift giving, they're still making millions and millions of dollars every year. And it's ludicrous in the sense that here you have a person who's actually not doing anything anymore, yet is making hundreds of millions of dollars, yet they're not giving it away. And in fact, uh, you know, one of the falsities of this is that I go to a lot of parties, people talk about impact investing, right? Well, that's just a fucking sham. Because if you're, why are you impact investing? My repeated experiences, these people use the same damn uh, criteria for any investment they make, but because it's theoretically doing good, that justifies them somehow getting paid for investing and going around and touting that you're an impact investor. If you're a fucking impact investor, what you should do is give the money away and any profit goes to a charity to be of service to others because you don't need the money. But oftentimes the wealthy look up at what they don't have instead of looking down at what they do have and seeing how blessed they are. Now, I could tell you innumerable stories, <laughs> which I won't, <laughs> but, or I will if you'd like me to. And again, I don't mean to go on this diatribe, and I'm sure that's not really the focus of our conversation here. But this has just been a truism that I've experienced over and over again. And now I'm probably much less 
polite than the average person in terms of making these statements. To me, and every bit of evidence I've seen, uh, they're truth. And you know, as the saying goes, I guess giving isn't giving unless it hurts. But as as you're describing these things, I, I have to ask you, why does it bother you so much? Like just meaning like how somebody else is you know spending their money or allocating their money. Is it bothering you for their sake in the sense that they're chasing some falsity that this will bring them some joy, or is there some other reason? Well, I think that's part of it. And I, I think that as you look in our society, there is ever increasing income inequality. What does income inequality do? It destroys lives, period. As an example, we have a minimum wage, not a living wage. And you have a lot of very wealthy people or in corporate America who avoid talking about that when there's every bit of evidence that if you create a living wage, that will improve lives and it won't really have an effect on the bottom line. So it is disturbing to me because, uh, again, it's not about making the money. It's about either how you make the money or what you do with the money. I'm sure you would agree that uh, beyond a certain level of wealth, what's the purpose unless you're of service to others? I mean, as an example, we have a prominent individual in that class who just spent $500 million on a new yacht. Where are we going with this? I mean, it's like, you know, or you repeatedly see, you know, people uh, having multiple 10,000 plus square foot homes for a family of two or three. I mean, frankly, I have a very nice home with four bedrooms. And uh, frankly, I can't imagine who I'm going to put in the next 10 or 15 bedrooms. I mean, where is this going other than to impress other rich people that you are significant? That's all it is. There's nothing there. You know, you walk through New York and you look at some of the most expensive residential condominiums. You look at night, almost 90% of them sit empty. Where are we going with that? And this is the problem with income inequality. It's not a fair playing field. And it makes people suffer. And it is the fundamental cause of the destruction of the middle class in America Again, you know, if you have $100 million, we'll give the next $100 million, $200 million away to be of service. You know, the other narrative, of course, is, well, I'm going to be ruthless and cheat and steal. And then when I, I'm worth, you know, a trillion dollars, then I'm going to give everything away. Well, the process, and you look at Andrew Carnegie or J.P. Morgan or some of these people, they were absolutely ruthless and destroyed zillions of lives along the way. <laughs> <laughs> to at the end say, okay, I'm giving it all away now. Well, what was the whole purpose of this, right? So again, is this a touch point? Sure, yeah, uh, no question it is. And I have to ask, because you know, now when you, when you founded, it was CCARE, right? The, the Center for Compassion, Altruism, Research, and Education. Hopefully I got that right. Uh, but in, in founding this, you know, there's this vision that you have, because I want to talk about just briefly, just really the big picture of what it is that you're trying to achieve and, and, and what you know, the research projects, both on compassion and altruism, what's really the driving force and the type of influence you're looking to make? Because it seems like you, know, you could, of course, impact those that have, you know, the ones that you're describing, the ones you know, essentially changing how people are you know investing their money or where they're dedicating it to or you can also or and uh, influence the people that you know are in a place where they don't have hope and provide them with this idea that they can impact their life and then they can be in more control of their decision making so I, I guess I'm just curious what's the broader vision for what you're trying to achieve well I actually believed that I could have a significant influence on the group of people we were just talking about Sadly, my repeated experience is it's falling on, for most people, deaf ears. Now, there are certainly exceptions, and I acknowledge that. But for the majority, they're not interested in that dialogue. That being said, if you give people tools and an inspirational narrative, it can change their lives. And really, uh, the research is wonderful. Look, I, I mean, Karen Armstrong, who won the TED Prize in 2008, uh, was a former nun. She brought together 19 spiritual and religious leaders who acknowledged that at the base of every religion is compassion and the golden rule. And in fact, this is a deep, deep core of who we are as humans. 
we get lost because of the way we've designed our society. And it's not necessarily our fault. It's just the way it is. But what I do know is that when you can inspire one person and all of us every day can change the lives of at least one person in some way. And sometimes it's simply by listening. Sometimes it's just simply by saying hello. When you can positively impact a person's life, that is huge. You know, there's a often said story about these two guys walking on a beach and there's been a storm. And all of these uh, starfishes are thrown on the beach. And the companion is taking, periodically picking up one and throwing it back into the ocean. And the guy he's with says, you know, why are you doing that? Uh, You know, you've got thousands of starfishes here. Why would you waste your time doing that? And, you know, his comment was, it matters to that starfish, right? And this is a recognition that, Look, there's always going to be suffering. There's always going to be these very challenging issues. But if each of us focuses our abilities, and whether that's your uh, talents as a human being, whether that's your wealth, on just saving one starfish, that can be enough. And, and it's interesting the the impact that can make because I recall you saying at one point, imagining a world with no bullying, you know, a prison where the vi- you know the violence rate is minimal, you know, the even even down the corporate environments for people that are listening, where you know the days lost from work and stress um, don't exist. Uh, it, I mean, it really does create a better world. So it's I mean, I think the work you're doing certainly is very meaningful. Now, you know, as we come to a close, this being the game changing attorney podcast, we ask everybody this: What does being a game changer mean to you? Beat of service to others, period. There's nothing more. I want to give a huge thank you to Dr. James Doty for taking the time to speak with us today. You know, what particularly resonated for me was when Jim said that the most successful individuals are not defined by their net worth, but rather how much they are of service to others. That being driven by compassion and altruism leads not only to a happier, but more fulfilled life. You've been listening to the Game Changing Attorney Podcast with me, Michael Mogul. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you could share the podcast with at least one other ambitious law firm owner who you believe would benefit. And you know what? Maybe more than one. For more information on our interview with Dr. James Doty, see the show notes for this episode in your podcast app or visit GameChangingAttorney.com. And join us next time and we'll be looking back at some of the best interviews, guests, and insights over the last few months on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Being crazy is a compliment. When somebody says you're crazy, that means you see things that other people can't see. Everybody that's done something special in life, they've all been criticized for being crazy. It's a compliment. When somebody says you're crazy, you're nuts, I said, yes, I am. That's next time on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Podcast.